I'm great. The Subcommittee on Elections of the Committee on House Administration will now come to order. Uh, before getting started this morning, I need to acknowledge each one of the commem uh, committee members who is present today. I need to do that by name just to make sure that we have a quorum and that the quorum is recorded. Uh, I'm informed that we have with us uh, Mr. Aguilar from California, Ms. Mr. Steele from Wisconsin, uh, Ms. Leger Fernandez from New Mexico, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Rodney Davis from Illinois, Congresswoman Scanlon from Pennsylvania, and joining us will be a uh, visiting member who is no stranger to this committee from the state of Alabama, Congresswoman Sewell. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask unanimous consent that she be allowed to participate in today's hearing. And of course, I should be recorded likewise for the forum. And so good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, if you're on the West Coast. Uh, as we begin today, I want to note that we are holding this hearing in compliance with the regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. Generally, we ask committee members and witnesses to keep their microphones muted uh, when not speaking to limit background noise. Uh, members will need to unmute themselves when seeking recognition or when recognized for their five minute presentations. Uh, witnesses will also need to unmute themselves when recognized for their five minutes or when answering a question. Members and witnesses, please, please keep your cameras on at all times. 
Even if you need to step away from the computer for just a moment, please keep your cameras on at all times. Uh, please do not leave the meeting or turn your camera off. I would also like to remind members that the regulations governing remote proceedings require that we cannot participate in more than one committee proceeding at the same time. And so at this time, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and have any written statements be made part of the record. I hear no objections. I hear no objections. Hearing no objections, uh, it is so ordered. At this time, members, I will ask unanimous consent that Representative Terry Sewell uh, of the 7th District of Alabama be invited to join us today for this subcommittee hearing. Uh, Congresswoman Sewell is no stranger to our committee. She works very hard in, in this space, and we are delighted to have her with, her, with us today. Uh, hearing no objection, it is so ordered. My friends, today we are examining voting in America, the barriers voters have historically faced and continue to face, as well as ways in which we can ensure every American enjoys free and fair access to the ballot box. One of our most sacred rights in this country is the right to vote. Indeed, as the US Supreme Court observed in Westbury versus Sanders, quote, other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if the right to vote is undermined, end of quote. As a Congress, as a nation, we cannot tolerate any voter suppression or any voter discrimination whatsoever. However, all too often access to the ballot in this country has been neither free nor fair. Time and time again in courtrooms all across the country, it has been proven that racially polarized voting has existed at the ballot box since 1870, since the 15th Amendment was ratified, and sadly, it persists today. During the last Congress, this subcommittee traveled all across the country. Yes, we did. I remember it so well. I remember going to North Dakota when it was zero degrees, and I remember going to the southern border. Uh, we traveled this country. Uh, we collected evidence that ultimately proved the persistence of voter suppression and discrimination. Nearly eight years after the Supreme Court decided the Shelby case, our work continues. It continues because voter suppression and discrimination still exist. At the time Shelby was decided, Chief Justice Roberts himself said voting discrimination still exists. That was the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He acknowledged that voting discrimination still exists, and so no one should deny that. It is our duty as, as elected members of Congress to uphold and defend the Constitution and to protect the rights of every single voter in this country. In a country that holds itself out as the greatest democracy in the world, every citizen deserves equal and unfettered access to the ballot box. The elections of last year showed us, showed us that when barriers are removed and voters are given options for when and how to cast their ballot, participation in our democratic process increases. And that increased participation does not compromise the integrity of our elections. In fact, it actually bolsters integrity. However, even in an election, with such high participation, access to the franchise was still last year. It was still not equal for all Americans. We can and we must do better. Congress cannot allow the access voters have to be rolled back yet again. In the years since the Shelby County case was decided, states all across the country have passed numerous voter suppression laws requiring long and costly battles to be waged in courtrooms to protect and defend the right to vote. This year, despite no credible evidence of any irregularities in the 2020 election, states are responding to Americans' participation in democracy by moving to curtail access, introducing suppressive voting legislation at an alarming rate. 
bills that if they were to become law would almost certainly disenfranchise our voters. According to an updated report published just today, this morning by the Brennan Center for Justice, state legislators have introduced 361 bills with restrictive voting provisions in 47 states, 47 states since the beginning of this year. This is a more than 40% increase in little more than a month since their February challenge. Across the country from Iowa to Georgia, bills are being advanced and signed into law that restrict voters access to the ballot. The Voting Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 wasn't written here in Congress. It was written between Shelby and Montgomery. I say that all the time. The Voting Rights Act wasn't written here in Washington. It was written between Shelby and Montgomery. It was by our fellow Americans who fought for equal access to what was supposed to be a democracy. And so today, we continue the work of ensuring each and every American has an equal voice and an equal vote. This will be the first of several hearings on this very important topic. The testimony provided today will help guide us as this committee seeks to understand what needs to be done to safeguard our elections and guarantee access to the ballot box. It is time, colleagues. It is time we encourage people to vote rather than continuing to erect barriers that seek to suppress the votes and voices of communities. And so I look forward to, to hearing from today's witnesses. I thank them for their participation. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this important issue. Now, before I recognize my friend, the ranking member, uh, let me just take a moment to recognize the chair of our full committee who has graciously joined us today from Northern California. I will now yield to the general lady from California, Congresswoman Zola Offering. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief. I wanted to uh, congratulate the committee for this, its first hearing in this Congress. You know, I remember I was just a schoolgirl uh, when the Voting Rights Act was signed into law in 1965. And the change that that made in our country where all Americans had a better chance uh, to exercise their franchise. The, uh, the law was renewed periodically on a bipartisan basis. Uh, the last time led by uh, then Chairman Jim Sensenbrenner and the Judiciary Committee who had uh, a substantial uh, record that unfortunately the court uh, discarded in the Shelby decision. So now it is our task uh, to compile the record to make sure that this essential law continues to protect the rights of Americans to vote. I couldn't be more thrilled uh, than having the opportunity to uh, appoint this chairman of this subcommittee. As we know, uh, the chairman uh, spent many, many years as a distinguished jurist uh, in North Carolina before running for Congress. He has a keen intellect, a great uh, uh, depth in the law, uh, a wonderful uh, temperament, and he is tenacious. So I know this is the beginning of a, of a very large a number of meetings and the work will be intensive, but I want to thank the subcommittee and especially the chairman uh, for taking this on because it will make a tremendous difference for our country. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the courtesy of allowing me to say these few words and I happily yield back. We well, thank you, Ms. Malkin, and, and best wishes to you. Uh, I will now recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Stile of the great state of Wisconsin for his opening statement. Mr. Stout, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, you having today's hearing. It's focused on today about uh, ensuring free and fair access to the ballot. And I'm glad we're talking about this uh, because Republicans want to ensure that every eligible person who wants to vote uh, is able to cast a vote uh, and that we make sure that every lawful ballot uh, is counted according to state law. Uh, I'd be remiss uh, not to point out a bit of irony as we're sitting here today uh, holding uh, an important investigative hearing after 
uh, the House passed H.R. 1, uh, a partisan vote in favor, a bipartisan po vote uh, in opposition to H.R. 1. And as many on, on this committee will recall, no opportunity uh, to mark up or make amendments uh, to learn from hearings like we could have had today uh, prior to that bill uh, being passed. But alas, uh, here we are uh, during Holy Week on a, uh, a district work period uh, joining together uh, to review uh, the importance of making sure that we have it easy to vote and hard to cheat. Um, and as we look back, more Americans are voting uh, than ever before. And I think you noted that in your opening comments that uh, it's great for our, our republic. In 2020, uh, 158.4 million Americans uh, voted in the presidential election, uh, the highest ever. Wisconsin had record voter turnout in the 2020 election, uh, like many states did. Wisconsin was in the top uh, five uh, for voter turnout. And I think it's remiss to not ask the question of ourselves, uh, was this because of a, of a federal mandate? Or was it because states were deciding what works best for them uh, as it relates to voting? Uh, those numbers, uh, I think, will shock some people listening to this because the narrative being pushed, I think, is counter to the idea that uh, we had 158 million Americans vote in the last election. And I think some of the narrative that we're hearing is because we're seeing fewer people voting while we're seeing higher people voting, uh, we need we have no choice but to federalize our election. The, the crisis you'll hear is so dire that H.R. 1 uh, needed to be rushed through the House, again, with only one hearing in this committee, no hearings in others, uh, no amendments allowed to be offered, in particular, no amendments following uh, a major global pandemic uh, that we're more or less still in. Uh, no ability to learn our lessons of what happened in the, the 2020 election to be implemented into this major piece uh, of legislation. So now we're stuck uh, with more of a messaging bill than a real viable piece of legislation that had true bipartisan input. Uh, what are some of the problems with H.R. 1? It guts voter ID protections. For example, uh, in Wisconsin, a state with a strong voter ID law, uh, this, would, this bill would allow an individual to vote uh, simply by signing a sworn uh, statement. That's it. It legalizes ballot harvesting at the national level. Uh, it allows federal funding of congressional campaigns, give government money to fund uh, politicians' reelection efforts, fund negative TV ads. And as we recall, the 800 page bill uh, was rushed through Congress uh, with no consideration of how it would be implemented at the state and local level. Uh, as we know uh, here, uh, each state has different election laws because. Each state is different. Uh, Wisconsin has a unique election system. In my home state here in Wisconsin, uh, while voter rolls are centralized, uh, elections are managed by clerks. We have 1,852 local governments uh, overseeing 2,800 polling places and 30,000 uh, poll workers. Very different than some of our other states uh, around the countries. And so laws that govern your right to vote should be made at the level of government closest to the people, not by politicians in Washington, D.C., uh, more focused on appeasing special interest groups, trying to get government money into their reelection efforts. Uh, we should be focused on what works for voters. So if there's issues with state laws, uh, we need to work with state legislatures, local officials uh, as to how to change them. That's what I'm doing. Uh, here in the state of Wisconsin. And so I'm real concerned that the Democrat proposal uh, that was put forward in HR1 is going to create more distrust uh, in our election process at a time when we need to secure our elections and restore trust uh, in our election system. In a time at of real record voting turnout, I don't think it's the time to be mandating a one-size-fits-all to our voting system. And so I look forward uh, to today's discussion and conversation. I do think it's a little bit disappointing we're doing this after uh, we rushed through HR1, but alas, here we are. Uh, and I do look forward to today's discussion. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Let me thank you, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, for your, your comments. And I look forward to working with you, Mr. Stout. Uh, we, uh, we have not had an opportunity to really bond since you have been appointed to the committee, but uh, because of COVID, we have had to keep our distances, but I promise you that we will uh, develop a relationship and, and try as best we can to work together on this committee. We have a long-standing history on this committee of, of good bipartisanship, and I look forward to, to having that relationship with you. Uh, your predecessor in office, Mr. Ryan, the former Speaker of the House, uh, was a dear friend, and we had a very strong 
uh, relationship, and I look forward to, to that with you as well. Uh, I look forward to proceed- that as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, before proceeding to our witnesses, I would like to extend to the ranking member of the full committee, uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Rodney Davis of Illinois, Congressman Davis, uh, an opportunity to make an opening statement as well. Mr. Davis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you have some big shoes to fill. I, I guess I have one question for you, sir. What cabinet position do you want after your time <laughs> as the chair of this subcommittee? Well, Rodney, I am so happy to be in the seat that I'm in representing the 750,000 people of North Carolina's first district. I think I will just stay right here for another decade. Well, I don't want that office next to me vacant, buddy. I, I want you there. It's great to uh, great Thank to you. be with you there. Great to have you here. And I do miss our former chair, Marsha Fudge, who has gone on to uh, brighter pastures as our new secretary of housing and urban development. I uh, couldn't think of a better person uh, to take over for her on the subcommittee. Uh, you know, one thing that you will find and the witnesses will find is the subcommittee is is going to be made up of people who genuinely like each other, Republicans and Democrats that actually genuinely get along. Unfortunately, the media doesn't talk about those issues. We will have our policy disagreements and you will see that here today. But in the end, hopefully we can come together to make sure we do what we all want is for every person who's legally able to cast a vote to be able to do so. And GK, I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chair. I'm very proud of our new ranking member of this subcommittee, Mr. Style. Uh, he's a, a very good member of our conference and one who is very interested in making not just the House work better, but our elections work better nationwide. So welcome aboard, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity, and I'll yield back without even making fun of Mr. Aguilar. (laughs) Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Thank you for your very kind words. Uh, In just a moment, I will introduce today's panel, but before I do that, as a reminder to our witnesses, each of you will be recognized for five minutes. I think most of you have testified previously, and so you know kind of how this thing works, Uh, but you will be recognized for five minutes. And there is a timer on your screen. So please be sure you can see the timer and and are mindful of the five minute time limit. You will, your entire written statements will be made a part of the record and the record will remain open for at least five days, five days for additional materials that may be submitted. And so welcome to each of our witnesses. Joining us today are Allison Riggs, who is the Southern She's with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Uh, We have Sonia Diaz, uh, UCLA, I guess that means University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Uh, We have Marcia Johnson Blanco uh, from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And Debo, I've always had problems pronouncing your name, sir. Uh, but welcome, welcome to our committee. And I know of your great work and, and, and I'm glad to have you back before the committee. Uh, Dave Boy is with the uh, uh, firm of Wilmer Hale, uh, also the Secretary of State, uh, Kim Wyman is with us from the state of Washington. Uh, Allison Riggs is the Interim Executive Director and Chief Counsel for Voting Rights at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice based in North Carolina, which is where I am at this moment. Uh, Ms. Riggs, Ms. Riggs's voting rights work over the last 10 or more years at SCSJ has been focused on fighting for fair redistricting plans, fighting against voter suppression and advocating for electoral reforms that would expand access to voting. She has litigated redistricting cases on behalf of the state NAACP conference in Texas and Florida and Virginia and right here in North Carolina. In 2018, she argued the Texas redistricting case in the U.S. Supreme Court. And in 2019, she argued the North Carolina partisan gerrymandering case in the Supreme Court. Sonia Diaz is a practicing civil rights attorney and policy advisor, founding director of UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative, Ms. Diaz co-founded the multi, first multi-issue policy think tank focused on Latinos 
in the University of California. She is responsible for overseeing all aspects of LPPI, including strategy, research, mobilization, and leadership. With a deep background in policy and advocacy, she is a regular contributor to the organization, organization's research portfolio. Prior to this assignment, Ms. Diaz served as policy counsel to Vice President Kamala Harris during her first and second terms as California's Attorney General. Next is Marcia Johnson Blanco. Uh, Marcia is the co-director of the Lawyers Committee's, the Lawyers Committee's Voting Rights Project. She manages the project's programmatic and advocacy portfolios, which includes leading election protection, the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection program, overseeing the work of the National Commission on Voting Rights, promoting election reform, ensuring minority participation in redistricting and ensuring that those with felony convictions regain their right to vote. Ms. Johnson Blanco started at the Lawyers Committee as a staff attorney back in 04, working on the first election protection program during a presidential election. The following year in 2005, she served as the deputy director of the National Commission on the Voting Rights Act, which was organized to review the record of discrimination in voting from 1982 to 2005. Uh, Debo, help me out, Stan. Adegbele. Adegbele. Right. Adegbele. Thank, thank God for staff. Uh, Debo is a partner at the Wilmer Hale uh, firm, uh, where he is a member of the government and regulatory litigation group, as well as a co-chair of the firm's anti-discrimination practice. Among his prior experience, he spent more than a decade working for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. In 2013, he argued his second Supreme Court case, Shelby County versus Holder. Previously, he argued the Northwest Austin versus Holder case in the Supreme Court. In addition to his practice at the firm, uh, our witness currently serves as a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights appointed by President Barack Obama in 2016. Our witness is here testifying today in his personal capacity. We need to make sure that is in the record. Finally, Secretary of State Kim Wyman of the great state of Washington is, is that state's 15th Secretary of State. First elected in 2012, she is only the second female Secretary of State in Washington's history. Prior to being elected, Secretary Wyman served as Thurston County Elections Director for nearly a decade, served three terms as the elected Thurston County Auditor. Secretary Wyman is responsible for overseeing state and local elections, corporation and charity filings, the Washington State Library, the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library, and the Washington State Archives. Uh, that completes the introductions. We are now going to recognize uh, each witness for five minutes. Ms. Riggs, you should go first. You are now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, members of the committee, and Representative Sewell. My name is Allison Riggs, and I'm the co-executive director of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. I also serve as chief counsel for voting rights. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My colleagues will, I'm sure, speak to you about what's happening in Georgia and Texas right now. But I want to tell you about the unjustified efforts here in North Carolina um, underway to make it harder to vote. North Carolina remains the most active battlefield in this unending war for, act, for access to the ballot box. Where the Southern strategy remains ever visible and effective, where politics are used as a proxy for race and embolden acts taken to restrict access to voting, and where electoral success by voters of color is met with voter suppression. For our most vulnerable voters who lack access to transportation, who work multiple jobs just to make ends meet, who suffer health conditions that restrict their mobility, practices that make it harder to vote absolutely make the difference between voting or not. And because of the ugly history of official racial discrimination in our country, those voters, vulnerable voters, are disproportionately voters of color. We have rightfully celebrated the numerous successes in administering the 2020 election, record turnout in many states, 
voters largely voting safely in a pandemic, but we can't stop the story there. In predominantly Black and Latinx communities across the area in which SESJ works, voters waited for hours to vote. The five states that did not allow unfettered access to vote by mail in 2020, Tennessee, Texas, Mississippi, Indiana, and Louisiana, were in the bottom 10 in turnout countrywide. Voters of color had their absentee ballots rejected at disproportionately high rates. There are laws and policies that contribute to this problem, and state legislatures are not acting to fix them. In fact, the opposite. In North Carolina, legislative efforts are now underway to restrict absentee voting. A proposed law would require absentee ballots to be received by 5 p.m. on election day to be counted. Not only would this make North Carolina an extreme outlier nationally, but in the data we provided to you on some of the days right after the election, when a timely postmarked ballot was received by election officials, black voters would disproportionately have their ballots thrown out. That same bill would move the deadline for requesting absentee ballots an entire week earlier than in 2020. By the analysis performed by our partners at Democracy North Carolina, nearly 50% of the thousands of ballots that would have been discounted had these proposed rules been in effect in 2020 would have been from voters of color. And even when in 2016, the Fourth Circuit found the North Carolina legislature guilty of intentional racial, racial discrimination, when it, among other things, cut early voting, a mechanism of access which Black voters disproportionately rely. The legislature responded in 2018 by passing a law that reduced the number of early voting sites offered in 2018 compared to 2014. And now in 2021, they're trying to restrict executive officials' ability to act in emergency situations to protect access to early voting. Lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't address the important redistricting processes that will be happening across the country later this year. For as long as we have been redrawing electoral district lines after decennial censuses, redistricting has been a tool used to dilute and silence the voices of voters of color. And this is the first redistricting cycle in decades where those voters won't have the protections of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. As I detailed in my written comments last redistricting cycle, the North Carolina General Assembly passed numerous state and local redistricting plans that violated the Constitution or were inconsistent with Section 2 remedies already in place. In North Carolina and other states, particularly where there are populations of significant populations of voters of color, Redistricting is one of the several known practices that should invoke heightened review by Congress and federal agencies. Congress needs to intervene to protect Black, Latinx, AAPI, and Indigenous voters. Thank you. Thank you. You hit it right on the mark, Ms. Riggs. Uh, at this time, we will recognize the next witness. Uh, Ms. Diaz is next to speak. Ms. Diaz, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairperson Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, and members of the Committee on Health Administration. My name is Sonia Diaz. I'm a licensed attorney and the founding director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Much of my research is on the intersections of law and policy as it relates to the nation's diverse Latino communities. Thank you for affording me the privilege of testifying on how we can strengthen American democracy. I think it's important to start with my story. I grew up in Northeast Los Angeles. My father, born and raised in East Los Angeles, and my mother, a farm worker from the Central Valley, gave me a community education grounded in civil rights. My siblings and I through the streets of Los Angeles, following our support for workers and immigrants, holding up signs at protests to advocate against discriminatory ballot initiatives, our tiny feet walked precincts to advocate for candidates that spoke to the issues that mattered most. It was from this perspective that my understanding of our democracy and our individual power to strengthen it was formed. Oftentimes when we talk about voter suppression, we focus on a set of jurisdictions that have long been held as bad actors in our law textbooks. 
places like Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida. But this frame too often leaves out an important fact. The attack on Americans' fundamental right to free and fair access to the ballot happens everywhere for all Americans. This is true of my story. As a young girl, I was able to see myself represented in government in ways that neither of my parents could fathom. Because of a federal court's decision in Garza v. Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors in 1990, the county was forced to create the first Latino majority seat. As a result, Gloria was the first Latino ever elected to that body. She is not the last. Ms. Molina's first supervisorial district seat is currently occupied by Hilda Solis, who was the first Latina to be appointed to a presidential cabinet. 30 years later, the LA County Board of Supervisors still has only one Latino majority district. Yet in the last 20 years, the Latino citizen voting age population increased by 77%. Unless Congress acts to remedy this pernicious vote dilution in LA, redistricting cycles will continue to fail the nation's largest Latino community. Another example is the state of Washington which like California has championed innovation to expand access to the ballot box and improve election administration. Both states have their own voting rights acts, yet Latinos remain targets of efforts to deny them meaningful participation in elections. Over the years, the UCLA Voting Rights Project has been involved in legal advocacy in Washington. The example of Yakima City is another compelling modern day challenge to voters that threatens American democracy. In 2014, a federal court ordered Yakima to create new single member city council districts to remedy an at-large districting scheme that routinely suffocated the voting preferences of Latinos. Yakima functions as a tale of two worlds, white and brown, and it's headed by a single street, 16th Avenue. Throughout history, there was a gross lack of Latino representation across all facets of civic life and routine underinvestment in the brown side of town. In the first election with the new districts, there was a moment of hope and opportunity where doors opened in a way Latinos had never seen before. That 2015 election resulted in political history. Three Latinas were elected to the city council. In response, the city clerk, along with some ousted white city council members resigned an entire month early to leave before the Mexicans arrived. The retaliation didn't stop. White council members sought to leverage an at-large ballot referendum to reduce the electoral voice of Latinos by creating a strong mayor system. UCLA immediately intervened to combat a system that if adopted, would retrogress Latino political power by de facto returning to an at-large election system. Vote dilution remains a persistent issue for Latino voters, even in seemingly progressive states with their own voting rights laws. The contemporary attacks on access to free and fair elections are inextricably tied to the growth of an electorate that remains key to American recovery and critical to a thriving, vibrant democracy. UCLA research estimates that 16.6 million Latino voters cast a ballot in 2020. This is the start and single largest four year increase for Latinos ever. These historic gains have been met with troubling backlash. Many of the new voter suppression laws are happening in the very states where Latinos played a significant role. Let me be clear, the threats to democracy are direct responses to the perceived and real prospect of an inclusive multiracial democracy. Congress has the power to change that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diaz, for your testimony. At this time, I will recognize the next witness, uh, Ms. Johnson Blanco. Ms. Blanco, you're with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and I don't know if you know this, this fact, but your organization back in the early 1980s filed a lawsuit against the city where I reside, where I am at this moment, uh, because of the unequal uh, application of municipal services, uh, to wit the fact that there were 23 miles of unpaved streets in this community, and it was your organization that litigated that and got 23 miles of streets paved. And so I don't know if you even know that, but I just want you to take that back to your organization. I again say thank you to, to the Lawyers Committee. This time you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Butterfield. I didn't know that, and I'm glad to hear that we played that role. Uh, Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, members of the subcommittee on elections and representative Lynn Scanlon. 
opportunity to testify today on the challenges that face far too many voters when voting. I'm Marcia Johnson Blanco, and for the past 17 years, I've worked to provide a through election protection. The nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection coalition committee for civil rights under law, where I'm the co-director for the Voting Rights Project. Election protections partners and volunteers provide voters throughout the country with comprehensive information and assistance at all stages of voting through a suite of voter protection hotlines, field programs, and engagement In 2020, we saw a sizable increase in voter turnout, but turnout varied by state. The states with the largest increase in voter turnout were those states that adopted reforms to expand access to the ballot. For example, the three states with the highest percentage point increase in turnout between November 2016 and November 2020 were Hawaii, California, and Utah, which mailed ballots to every registered voters in the state in 2020, but did not do so in 2016. By contrast, those states with the most restrictive laws tend to be the states with the lowest turnout. The high overall turnout in 2020 was the product of robust engagement by voting advocates to address barriers to the vote, including unprecedented litigation to break down barriers. During 2020, the Election Protection Coalition organized 46,000 hotline shifts, 43 field programs, and received 246,000 calls from voters across the country. And the Lawyers Committee also participated in an unprecedented number of law lawsuits, state election systems of unnecessary restrictions. In Alaska, the Lawyers Committee and our partners successfully overturned the witness requirement for absentee ballots after showing that the witness requirement would disenfranchise Native voters. In Missouri, the Lawyers Committee and Co-Counsel challenged the state's arbitrary restrictions on no excuse voting by mail. And in Ohio, Lawyers Committee and Co-Counsel successfully to overturn a directive by the Secretary of State that would limit drop box locations to one per county. Litigation made a difference, although victories at the trial court level were repeatedly overturned by hostile appellate courts. After the election, the Lawyers Committee participated in the defense of an extraordinary number of lawsuits brought by the losing presidential candidate and his allies aimed at throwing out legitimately cast votes, often in states, and this often had uh, impact on voters of color in states such as Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Overall, in 2020, the Lawyers Committee participated in 50 lawsuits. Despite our efforts, far too many voters confronted barriers to the vote, included restrictive voter ID laws, cutbacks to early voting, consolidation or elimination of polling places, and restrictions on voter um, community-based voter registration groups, and also rejection of absentee ballots through the misuse of signature matching procedures. In 2021, we are witnessing a backlash across states, including requiring photo ID for absentee ballot applications and ballots, restricting flexibility of county officials to provide opportunities when needed. And many of these bills continue to disproportionately impact voters of color. Bills such as the law passed in Georgia and similar laws across the country make clear the need for federal legislation to establish national standards. The For the People Act passed by the House on March 3rd would create a new national baseline for election administration. Without congressional action, the 2020 elections and its aftermath may become an inflection point in our nation's history with a future being one with states providing two different voting systems, one that provides access and one that provides stringent restrictions. We must act to prevent this dismal future, and we must act now. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony at this time, Mr. Adegbele. I'm going to keep practicing until I get it right, sir. Uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. 
Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, ranking member, members of the committee, the subcommittee and the committee. It's uh, good to be with you today. As, uh, as Mr. Butter Butterfield said, as Representative Butterfield said, I'm here today in my individual capacity. I'd like to focus my testimony today on four broad points. First, I want to talk a bit about, as my predecessors have, the current threats to our democracy and the vital importance of the minority inclusion principle in federal law. I also want to put some of this in context. We've heard a bit about history. I want to speak a little bit more about it and reinforce the impact of the Supreme Court's ruling in Shelby County v. Holder, which invalidated core provisions, um, uh, the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Next, I'll touch briefly on the historical pattern of mobilization and voter mobilization and how increased momentum in minority inclusion and electoral success can result in backlash, as Ms. Johnson Blanco just said, and then speak to the congressional authority. Our beloved departed member of this body, Congressman John Lewis, wrote in his final essay that democracy is not a state, it's an act, and each generation must, must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community. Implicit in this important idea is the recognition that democracies are fragile and require constant care. We know this, and seemingly every day we are reminded why. Democracy presents candidates for elected office with two paths for electoral success, both with deep historical roots. Candidates can choose the path of mobilization, doing the hard work of building support for their offer of service and leadership through active engagement and advancement of popular policies, while also working to enhance mobilization. In contrast, Others can take, we, we, in contrast, others can take a different approach and try to demobilize. They can try to impose barriers. I think of these two alternate paths as democracy's high road and democracy's low road. We've heard about the uh, extraordinary turnout in the last election. 43 states and legislatures have also introduced over 250 bills. As we know, because the meter keeps running every day, these stats change every day. I, I think uh, Mr. Butterfield, Representative Butterfield, had a different number based on a report released today. That's a sign of trouble. We've heard about Georgia's bill 202 that is now being challenged in courts, and we, we hear about the coming law in Arizona. All of these are causes for concern. But Congress has played an important role in pushing back on this. It elevated the Voting Rights Act as an answer to persistent and adaptive voting discrimination that had persisted and was entrenched over a long period of time. And it made the Voting Rights Act a federal statement of a minority inclusion principle. So what do we know about Shelby County and the congressional role in responding to it? Chief Justice Roberts relied on the gains that we had because of the Voting Rights Act and declared that the South had changed. The court recognized that Congress had developed an ample record of ongoing discrimination, but it determined that contrary to the congressional judgment, the coverage mechanism was outdated and no longer reflected current conditions. Justice Ginsburg called that approach throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. We knew what would happen if, so, if Shelby County was decided as it was, and we've seen it, we're living it, we're living it this week. Though section two remains in place, it is not a pre-implementation remedy, and it takes years to win section two victories that are costly, and very often you have the benefits of incumbency vesting in people that may not be entitled to those offices if the system were being conducted fairly. So why is history important in all of this? Well, let me share an idea with you. We've heard about turnout and all the positive things that come from it. What, what I know as a voting rights litigator is that turnout and participation and mobilization is sometimes the very thing that is a precursor for retrenchment and discrimination. This is the historical pattern. I point you to examples. I point you to Kilmichael, Mississippi. Uh, certainly we had tons of examples during reconstruction. The Supreme Court's case in Hunter v. Underwood. We can think about um, the LULAC decision, the, the Texas redistricting decision, where the Supreme Court recognized that just as Latinos were on the verge of exercising their political power, they were cut off at the pass by the legislature. The majority said that the acts of the Texas legislature in the post-2000 round of redistricting bore the mark of intentional discrimination. Why does this matter? It matters for this reason. 
history tells us that the clock can go backwards, that if we are not vigilant, the success of participation can be a precursor to discrimination. That is the pattern we have seen consistently since Shelby County. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your remarks. Uh, at this time, the chair will recognize Secretary Wyman for five minutes. Thank you, Chairperson Butterfield, Ranking Member Seil, and members of the committee and subcommittee for inviting me to appear as a witness today. For the record, I'm Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman, and I'm proud to serve as the Chief Elections Officer in a state that's already implemented nearly every election requirement proposed in HR 1. In the 2020 presidential election, 90% of Washington's voting eligible population was registered to vote, and we had the fifth highest turnout in the country. Washington's accept accessible registration and voting system employs robust safeguards that ensure only one ballot can be counted for each eligible voter in an election. Maintaining a balance between voter accessibility and election security is foundational to inspiring public confidence in election outcomes. The Washington State serves as a model for a successfully implementing same-day and automatic voter registrations, equitable voter list maintenance, expanded mail-in voting, and many other progressive policies. I can tell you, building an election system that balances access and security took time, money, bipartisan collaboration, and the active engagement of state and local election administrators working closely with legislators to constantly improve our processes. Innovation in election administration isn't unique to Washington. It happens in states across the country every day and needs to happen with HR1. The overly prescriptive and one-size-fits-all approach contained in the election sections of HR1 discount the voices of state and local election officials who share valid concerns about their ability to implement these sweeping changes within the defined timeframes and leaves little margin for states' innovation in election administration. In 2000, following the politically charged and razor-thin presidential election, Congress took on comprehensive national election reform with the passage of the Help American Vote Act of 2000. This process provides a reliable pathway for creating impactful election reform legislation today. Con congressional members worked across the aisle to draft bipartisan policies while actively seeking input from election administration experts and the public to perfect them. Last year's election was the most litigated presidential election in our history, with hundreds of lawsuits being filed before and after Election Day. States adopted policies and procedures to provide safe voting options in the midst of the pandemic. Election officials conducted high turnout elections through hurricanes, wildfires, social unrest, and active cybersecurity threats. Throughout these unprecedented circumstances, our country's election system remained resilient. One portion of the electorate is concerned that laws passed by state legislatures will disenfranchise voters who struggled to participate last year. Rampant misinformation and disinformation in, the 2020, in 2020 tore at the fabric of our democracy and shattered confidence in our elections with another portion of the electorate. Despite numerous audits and recounts demonstrating the accuracy of election results and multiple federal agencies proclaiming unequivocally this was the most secure election in our nation's history, some voters still lack confidence in the integrity of mail-in balloting. We must move forward and begin rebuilding the confidence lost in both election security and voting accessibility. Fast-tracking an 800-page bill written without meaningful input from state and local election experts is not the answer. The goal, if the goal, is to provide national consistency in registering and voting for U.S. citizens, I recommend establishing baseline expectations for states to meet. This is preferable to implementing highly rigid and prescriptive policies that may be unworkable within the timeline specified and will stifle innovation in states now and for decades to come. Our Constitution gives states the important role of administering our country's elections. Election officials in every state work to inspire the public's confidence in election returns and provide members of Congress the same confidence in the certified results of federal elections. Examples would be setting timelines for registration and residency or standards for the minimum number of voting machines, ballots, and voting opportunities. As you move forward, I encourage you not to constrain states' authority to conduct elections in a narrow, limiting manner. Rather, empower them to improve election administration. 
My colleagues and I in state and local election offices across the country stand ready to work with you and ask you to include us in your work to create bipartisan solutions that improve elections for all Americans. Thank you. And since I have a minute or two, I have to uh, give a shout out to Gonzaga um, and uh, you know UCLA, we're gonna take you on. Thank you so much. Now, Madam Secretary, you're causing trouble here today. Uh, I know there are differences of opinion among this committee and among those who are watching this broadcast, but uh, thank you so very much for your service and thank you for your testimony today. Well, the time has arrived for member questions. Uh, members are gonna be recognized uh, each for five minutes. Uh, I'm going to first recognize the, the gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar from Redlands, California, I believe it is. Mr. Aguilar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it and it is an honor to be back uh, on this subcommittee. Uh, you and I uh, worked with this uh, committee and uh, then Chairwoman Fudge in the, in the last round and I look forward to your leadership uh, as well. And honored to be joined by my, by my new colleagues on the full committee uh, and uh, Ms. Ledger Fernandez on, on this committee. And thankfully, we also traded up on the ranking member side as well. So uh, an honor to be with, uh, with, all, of, with all of you. Um, Ms. Diaz, I was struck by your testimony uh, when you stated that since Shelby County, uh, since the Shelby decision, there have been nearly 1,700 poll closures across the United States. The majority of those occurred in three jurisdictions previously covered by Section 5 of the VRA, and all of which have growing Latino communities. Uh, for example, in Texas, the number was 750 sites, 32 in Arizona, 214 in Georgia. Can you explain why these polls were closed over the past seven years and how they impact voters, especially Latino voters? Absolutely. Thank you, Representative Aguilar. I think it's important to note that there was no longer a preclearance requirement for many of these jurisdictions, including Arizona, Texas, and Georgia, where they had to go to the federal government to seek um, permission and authorization for any changes to their electoral process. What's important here is, is that the number of Latino voters has been rapidly increasing. Among the competitive battleground states, Arizona, Florida, Texas, and even Nevada, the percent growth in Latino citizen voting age population outpaced that of non-Hispanic whites. When we think about percentage point differentials from 2008 to 2019, it's stark, plus 84 percentage points in Nevada, plus 65 in Florida, 52 in Arizona, 40 in Texas. And so at the same time that Latino citizen voting age population is growing, we're seeing these poll closures. And this is frankly making it difficult for people to access a ballot, even in states like Texas during a COVID-19 pandemic that did not want to expand universal vote by mail. So they have less places to go vote, less polling locations, and less means to cast a ballot to protect their lives. You also mentioned that researchers have long agreed that regressive electoral reforms and restrictive voting uh, bills discourage eligible uh, uh, voters uh, from casting ballots and don't provide any real benefit toward election security. Uh, as, as Secretary of State Wyman just mentioned, our elections are secure um, and states like California and Washington, who have been doing robust vote by mail uh, systems for years and early voting options um, uh, are, are absolutely secure. Why do you think states continue to implement uh, Ms. Diaz regressive voting laws uh, that provide no benefit to keeping our elections secure? It's hard to think about an answer to that that is generous. And so if I'm generous, um, I'll say that there maybe is a perceived threat of voter fraud, but we've been through this time and time again, and it's been nullified even under Donald Trump's presidency. And so if I'm not being generous and I'm being rational, I can't, happen, I can't help but think that the growth of a youthful and diverse electorate is happening and occurring at the same time that over the course of the last years, pre-Shelby and post-Shelby, we've seen an avalanche of suppression bills whether it's poll closures, it's voter ID, or other means. And so to me, there is a correlation there, and it has to do with stifling Americans' access to the ballot box. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Secretary Wyman, I don't want to get into the Gonzaga versus UCLA uh, issue, but but would you would you agree that same day registration and universal vote by mail um, works in the state of Washington and makes it easier for citizens to vote? It does because we have uh, really engaged our electorate and we have built in the security measures that really counter claims of voter fraud so our citizens can have confidence that our results are, are valid. And, and you would agree that it could be replicated in other states if you build on that confidence, if you take the security measures you know, seriously, and if you work to educate the public? Absolutely. And you know, I think the big caveat is it takes time and money. Um, and that's part of why we had success in 2020 as a, as a country is because Congress, thank you very much, uh, did give us uh, about $1.2 billion in HAVA 2 and 3 and, and CARES Act. But yes, uh, with time and money, it can be done. Why don't your peers, I don't have much time, why don't your peers in other states uh, believe uh, that it will make citizens, um, uh, that it will be easier to vote by having a vote by mail and, and mail-in ballot and, and same-day registration? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just struck by that, that some of your peers uh, don't believe that. And I, I don't have much time left, so um, you know, maybe we'll have to, to, to get that answer down the line. But um, uh, that, that's, that's why we're here. That's why we're exercising oversight. That's why we're asking these questions, uh, because so many people uh, across uh, this country don't have the opportunities that people in California and Washington have uh, to exercise that right to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. At this time, the chair will recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, appreciate uh, the recognition. I'd like to dive in. <clears throat> I was reading a New York Times article the other day on HR1, and, and it stated that uh, election administrators have started to raise questions and complaints about the bill. It said, quote, uh, they're simply, uh, they weren't consulted on a major federal rewrite of the system. Uh, they believe they've been, uh, that has been overseen effectively. One Democratic state elections director uh, said the early voting mandates in the bill uh, would require a county of 2,000 residents to keep polls open for 15 days, 10 hours a day, uh, even for an off-year congressional primary that draws only a handful of voters. Uh, and they said such uh, an inflexible requirement, according to this director who spoke on condition of anonym anonymity for fear of repercussions, uh, would create problems, not solve them. Uh, Secretary Wyman, you oversee the, the state of Washington. Uh, were you consulted uh, as we, as Congress passed HR1 uh, this year? No, I haven't been. No, I think I think that's too bad. But do you do you agree with the assessment, I guess, of this anonymous source, but it's the New York Times, uh, that there would be real challenges in implementing uh, some of the reforms that were in place in HR1? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think that goes to what I mentioned in my testimony, that that it's the prescriptive nature and very specific uh, elements of, of HR1 that make it problematic for uh, election officials to be able to implement in the time in the timelines prescribed. For example, um, uh, I'm trying to find my, my best one here. I, I, I think the uh, uh, VVSG, the uh, voting uh, standards that were set out for the EAC haven't even been, they've just been passed. We don't even have a testing uh, facility that can test to those standards. And um, the timeline that's presented for the 22 election is going to be problematic. Our state wouldn't have a certified system because if you don't meet the standards and have your systems tested, they're decertified. That's a huge problem nationally. So I, th I think you and I, I share a lot of concerns that uh, if HR1 kind of gets rammed through, uh, not getting the input of states uh, and election officials like yourself, uh, that there could be some real world complications. Um, I, I really share that concern. Let's dive in a little bit, uh, the state of Washington that you oversee. Uh, can you walk us through again, a couple of these election integrity uh, measures that you've put in place in your state? Uh, and in particular, how you utilize voter ID in the state of Washington uh, to make sure that it's both easy to vote, but also hard to cheat. Absolutely. Uh, Washington State has had voter ID since 2006, and we required at the time of, of voter registration, they have to provide a, a Washington State ID card or Washington State driver's license or the last four of their social security number. These are verified and the vast majority of our applicants provide one of those three. We also have um, alternate ID. This is one of the, the key elements of vote by mail elections, which we conduct in, in Washington State, because we can have a high confidence level that the people that are registered are actual people that have walked into a government agency and, and proven who they are. Um, and it's separate from voter registration. We also have a statewide voter registration system and election management system 
system that connects our 39 counties in real time. So on election day, they have real time up to the minute information for anyone who walks into a voting center. They can issue a ballot. And if one has already been issued, they can cancel that first one and issue a new one or register a person for the first time. And this is really how we have confidence that we're only counting one ballot, no matter how many we've issued to a voter. And finally, we're part of the ERIC project, um, the, the nationwide uh, 31 states, I believe, are, are um, uh, members right now. And we are able to keep our roles maintained and also identify potential voters when they move into our respective states and reach out to them and show them how to uh, register and vote. As you're aware, every state is very different. So in my home state of Wisconsin, uh, we have a little over 1,800 clerks uh, managing the elections at a very local level in our state. My understanding, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, Washington uh, under you is uh, 39 counties and your elections are held uh, at the county level. Um, could you just comment briefly uh, some of the challenges of rushing through a major piece of legislation like HR1 uh, without really reaching out to all of these election officials uh, like yourself uh, that are actually the boots on the ground kind of technically implementing uh, that would be forced to technically implement some of these federal mandates if they came through? The biggest challenge is just the diversity across the country. And again, it goes back to time and money. So even in my state, I have a jurisdiction that has over a million registered voters, and I have some that have a few thousand. So to, to make just a one size fits all issue or, or mandates is very much an issue for each of those counties. And, uh, you know, we, we're going to need the resources and it can't just be one time money like HAVA was. And then, you know, over time, you have the disparity of, of counties because some have money and some don't. Thank you very much. Seeing the time, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. At this time, the chair recognizes the general lady from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Congresswoman Ledger Fernandez. I Thank looked it you. up, Teresa. I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And Santa Fe, New Mexico is beautiful right now. And we don't have any um, it, 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 we don't have any team in the race. So I'm staying out of all of that. But I am thankful to you for bringing to this committee the voting rights uh, experts today to talk about the impact of both those 361 bills um, and existing barriers. You know, I think that increasing voter participation should be the goal of every lawmaker, whether that be Republican or Democrat, because right, uh, it's the core of our democracy. Uh, and I was real pleased to know that 4 million more Latino voters cast a ballot in 2020 than in 2016. Native Americans defied the devastation of COVID, you know, here in New Mexico and throughout the Southwest to vote in higher numbers. Ms. Diaz, uh, you noted that Latino voters are younger than the average and the 30.9% increase represents many first time voters. What happens when a first time voter faces voting barriers like long wait times? Does it impact that voter's likelihood of becoming a lifelong voter? Absolutely, voter suppression is a feedback loop, especially for youthful and growing diverse electorates who are already left out of the franchise because there's not a lot of data on them on the voter file. So they're not gonna get all the information that likely voters already expect. So if a first time voter is trying to cast a ballot and faces barriers, whether those are long lines, trying to figure out where to vote because the polling location has closed, trying to produce the ID because the state they live in doesn't take their student ID, then they're not gonna cast a ballot and they're gonna remain in this um, spectrum and universe of voters who have not casted a ballot and are not gonna get that information. It's until they cast that first ballot that they're going to be in the universe that receives all of the messaging and mobilization that makes our democracy great. So this is really a clear and present danger as we think about Asian American voters and Latino voters who are very young. Thank you. And you listed some of the different uh, barriers that apply. Why can't we accept these barriers uh, or these measures as simply good governance measures that would apply equally to all? Well, let me bring up the case of Miss Brenda Lee Garcia, who was a 44 year old resident of Bexar County, Texas and a longtime voter. Under Texas's vote by mail um, law, she had to be over the age of 65. Yet, Miss Lee Garcia was a registered working nurse during a global pandemic, helping us save American lives. And Texas law made it so that Miss Garcia was not eligible for a mail ballot. So I don't know how, what legitimate governmental interests would be 
to really force somebody who is there in our hospitals during a global pandemic when people are dying unnecessarily, that they in fact have to really balance saving lives, staying healthy, and their fundamental right to vote. Thank you. Ms. Wiggs or Mr. Adig Boulay, <laughs> I've also litigated Section 2 redistricting cases. And as you know, they're intense and they're time consuming. Um, so you noted that Section 2 alone uh, won't protect the vote, partially because of the long time frame it takes to uh, conclude a case. Can uh, either of you speak to um, what you believe must be done to restore the efficacy of the Voting Rights Act? I think, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Representative, and I'll be brief so Mr. Adegbele has time to respond as well. We need a uh, dynamic Voting Rights Act, Section 5, that addresses the current issues that we have in places where there are recent um, instances and examples of discriminatory acts those are the actors that uh, a, re a renewed Voting Rights Act needs to be addressed at. There are also practices that we know disproportionately harm voters of color. And without a preclearance mechanism, uh, we can bring as many Section 2 cases as we want, but the wheels of justice turn slowly and, the, and, and elections will proceed under un illegal unconstitutional plans before we can get relief, even preliminary injunction relief. So those known practices include adding at large seats um, in heavily minority areas, uh, certain voter purges, redistricting where there are um, significant voters of color. The We need the Voting Rights Act to be able to do our work to use Section 2 appropriately and obtain relief timely. Uh, Mr. Adibi, we're sort of out of time, but if you could do a really quick summary. Sure. Um, the, the new legislation should focus on, on the current needs. That was one of the concerns that the Supreme Court had. History can inform those needs. That is to say where you have continuing patterns, and there have been lots of patterns of persistent and adaptive discrimination. History is relevant, but it has to be any geographic remedy you would have for a pre-implementation, pre-clearance type regime that has the advantage of blocking and deterring discrimination before it can be visited on the victims is, is really important. Um, the other things I would say is that the burden shift was, was a very important tool as well, and that, that's uh, important to have. I yield back, thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I thank you for your questions. At this time, the chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Davis from Taylorville, Illinois. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my first questions are going to go to Secretary Wyman. In spite of her uh, inability to choose the right teams to root for in football, baseball, and now college basketball, uh, in spite of Mr. Aguilar being from the LA area, I'm for the underdog. Go, go UCLA. Hey, uh, Secretary, during the 2020 election, we sent numerous election observers and committee staff throughout the country to observe various congressional races before, on, and after Election Day. We identified uh, similar issues in several states. Uh, no or very minor safeguards for mail balloting, lack of proper enforcement of signature verification, lack of voter list maintenance, and, and slow ballot counting. Uh, can you, uh, I, I got a couple questions first before I, I do want to ask you uh, about your mail-in balloting processes, but uh, can you, I, I'm sure you would agree with me that everyone's goal in in any election is to ensure every eligible voters able to cast a ballot, right? I mean, Correct. most people Correct. Are, are voting, they're, they're voting for good democracy. Uh, and you're not in the business as a secretary of state of preventing lawful voters from voting, are you? No. How about your county auditors, are they? No. Thanks. And, and in Washington state, you and your team have really worked hard to implement this vote by mail system. And you've been able to do that because Washington state gets to decide what works best for Washingtonians, right? Correct. Now, you're all mail-in state. You've been here before. Thank you for coming back. Always great to see you again. I'm proud to call you a friend. Walk us through how you moved to an all-mail system. How long did that take and what did it entail? It took many years and it really began in the early 1990s when we started allowing any voter to choose to be an absentee voter for all elections. 
by 2004, about 40 to 60 percent, depending on our counties, uh, each county had permanent absentee voting status, and we had the closest governor's race in the country's history. Uh, out of that, some of the election reform allowed our counties to choose to be vote by mail permanently. And that was about the time we were implementing the Help America Vote Act. So many counties moved in 2005, and it took another five years for the rest of the state to be mandated, actually, to move to vote by mail. Because we do have some people in the state that do not like vote by mail elections. So uh, we've been vote by mail since 2011. And uh, in all of that time, we've been, like I said, working with our legislature and the 39 county auditors to really build in the security measures and the accessibility that our voters need. Well, thank you. I'm really very proud of your testimony uh, following the 2020 election that said voters need to know there's a logical beginning, middle, and clear and final end in any election. I appreciate you being here again, Kim. Uh, my next question, uh, Ms. Di Ms. Diaz, uh, in your testimony, you highlight 10 states that have significant increases in the number of Latino voters since 2008. My home state of Illinois being one with a 41.88 percentage increase. Given this change in the Latino citizen voting age population, should Illinois use this data when drawing its new congressional districts? Well, absolutely. When we think about redistricting, we really need to look at total population and we also need to look at citizen voting age population. I think that Illinois needs to go beyond that, recognizing that there were various issues with the 2020 decennial census. And so we need to make sure that the households, particularly those that were hard to reach communities, those that are low income with veterans, with children are adequately counted. And I'll tell you why, as you know, this has a lot to do with political representation, but it also has to do with the allocation of resources. And I recognize that a lot of the comments right now from the secretary of state um, are about local control. And I think that if resources are permitted from you and your committee members and the members of Congress to ensure that we have free and safe access to American democracy, then I think we can all get on board. So yes, I do think that data matters. I think that the growth of the Latino population- I got well, I'm gonna reclaim my time. I apologize, I don't have much left. And uh, although I really respect the chair, I know he's not gonna give me any more. Um, do you think Illinois should draw another Hispanic congressional district with the large increase in Hispanic uh, voters in Illinois, and only one Hispanic majority elected member of Congress out of 18 districts right now? I think that Illinois should follow the law and recognize that data in section two really clarifies how one should integrate that data. Um, I need to look at it. Again, the data will not be here. It's actually the latest data uh, from the SIS. It's not to arrive until September. So it, it is, Ms. Diaz, but here in Illinois, um, our elected officials are going to be using estimated American community survey data to draw congressional maps and state legislative maps. And I would love to sit down with you and your organization uh, to look ahead. I mean, I certainly hope that if, uh, if this increase in Latin American population and voting age population in the state of Illinois is not part of the congressional redistricting process. I certainly hope your organization will be looking at filing, looking at filing lawsuits in the future. So with that, I'm out of time. I, I yield back and thank you for uh, all, all of you for being here. You're on mute, Mr. Chair. You giving me the gavel? No, I'm back online now. Thank you, thank you so much for your questions. At this time, the chair will recognize, let's see who's next on the list. Uh, Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon from Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Butterfield. On 2020 elections saw an unprecedented number of voters cast their ballots on or before election day, often using mail-in ballots. And in Pennsylvania, where I live, we were grateful that in 2019, a bipartisan effort between our Republican legislature and our Democratic governor had expanded access to the ballot by allowing no excuse mail-in voting for the first time. That law was passed as part of, as I said, a bipartisan effort to modernize Pennsylvania's election infrastructure long before the coronavirus pandemic had added public health reasons to use mail-in ballots. So as in elsewhere in the country, mail-in voting increased exponentially. It also increased participation, 
over three quarters of our Pennsylvania electorate turned out for the presidential election with almost 40% of the ballots being cast by mail. Unfortunately, as the first election in which universal vote by mail was available in Pennsylvania, that was the 2020 primary election and efforts to educate the public about the new mailing ballot process and the multiple levels of security to ensure ballot integrity, those efforts were undermined as former President Trump and his allies began to allege without any proof that mail-in voting was subject to fraud. And in fact, despite unsuccessful ballot challenges and lawsuits on behalf of the former president, and even a completely baseless objection to Pennsylvania's electoral ballots on January 6th, no one ever produced any evidence that Pennsylvania's electoral results were impacted by any misconduct. But as Secretary Wyman has noted, vote by mail can require some fine tuning. And one of the issues that Pennsylvania encountered was that the new law did not allow county boards of election to process ballots before election day. And with millions casting mail-in ballots, the counting process took some time, as we all saw. However, rather than fine tune Pennsylvania's mail-in ballot process, what has resulted from those false allegations is that Republican lawmakers in Pennsylvania have introduced more bills to restrict the right to vote in Pennsylvania than any other state government in the country. And those changes are, are trying to make mail-in mail voting more difficult by limiting who is eligible and restricting options for returning the ballot. So as someone who believes that we should strive to increase voter participation for all eligible voters and pass policies to expand, not limit the use of mail-in balloting, I'm obviously concerned. So um, Ms. Johnson Blanco, I wanted to start by thanking you for the work you've done um, with the Lawyers Committee and the Voting Rights Project and have had the, the privilege over time of participating in some of those efforts. Can you discuss the success of mail-in voting in Pennsylvania and across the country in the 2020 election? Yes, um, what we saw in 2020 is that mail-in voting offered additional access to the ballot and the fact that so many voters took advantage of this opportunity showed that it's a needed um, reform for voters. And unfortunately, what we're seeing now is a backlash to the use of mail-in voting and that increased access. And rather than states um, ensure that voters have increased um, opportunity to vote by mail, they're doing the opposite. So we really, um, as I noted, are in a, at an inflection point where rather than build on the access and opportunities we saw with mail-in voting, there are far too many states that are going in the opposite direction. And this has a disproportionate impact on voters of color and all voters overall. Thank you. Can you dispel some of the misinformation about the security of ballot drop boxes? Yes. Um, there had been um, studies done after the election looking at the allegations um, related to mail-in voting and have found that those um, allegations of fraud or mischief were unfounded. I think that the jurisdictions that have used um, drop boxes have actually allowed opportunities for voters to submit their ballots in a timely manner, and there hasn't been any evidence that there was um, any security um, flaws in being able to do so. Um, Ms. Wyman, um, you've talked about Washington's long-standing use of mail-in voting. Um, like Washington, Pennsylvania requires proof of citizenship when people register to vote, and the mail-in ballots have multiple layers of security. Um, what do you say to individuals who are concerned that mail-in voting leads to widespread voter fraud? <laughs> that hasn't been our experience in Washington State. And I and because we have a long, rich history of that practice, we have a lot of data and a lot of documentation to be able to show and disprove the allegations of voter fraud. And it certainly was top of mind following the 2020 election. And uh, that's why the security measures are important. Um, in Washington State, can you pre-canvas your ballots? Can you start processing mail-in ballots before Election Day? Yes, we have an 18-day voting window before Election Day, and they can begin processing those as, as soon as they return. 
And this is why you need to talk to election officials. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're hoping that our, our state legislature in Pennsylvania uh, will listen to the election officials who are universally saying they need some fine tuning of the Pennsylvania laws, not because of fraud, but because they just need the logistics to work in terms of timing to get the votes in and get and get the results out as quickly as possible. Thank you to all of our witnesses here. I really appreciate it and I yield back. The general lady yields back. Thank you, Congresswoman Scanlon. At this time, the chair will recognize himself for five minutes. And let me address my first question to you, Ms. Riggs. Again, thank you so very much for your testimony today and thank you for your incredible work, not just in North Carolina, but throughout the country. Uh, Ms. Riggs, prior to the Shelby County case, 40 counties in North Carolina were covered by the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, there were 60 counties that were not included. In other Southern states, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and the like, the entire state was included. But for North Carolina, it was 40 counties because of demonstrated discrimination in those 40 counties in prior years. According to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights from 1980 to 2013, the Department of Justice had issued over 50, 50 objection letters, and I was part of some of those as a practicing attorney, over 50 objection letters under Section 5 regarding proposed election law changes in North Carolina, including quite a few since the year 2000. My question is, has the loss of preclearance made it more difficult to track changes at the local level that could have a discriminatory effect on voters? It absolutely has. One of the things that we were able to monitor through preclearance submissions on the U.S. Department of Justice website was precinct closures, polling place closures. There are 100 counties in North Carolina. For us to be able to monitor that, monitor that effectively and efficiently, particularly in order to intervene in time, we have to go county by county, essentially, or submit public records requests to the State Board of Elections. It's onerous. And we're missing opportunities to protect voters in the meantime. Without preclearance, the time and expense of protecting the right to vote has exponentially increased. Litigation. Litigation can be costly. It can be time consuming. It can mount into the millions of dollars. It's burdensome. Uh, election day does not change, even if court deadlines do. Sometimes lawsuits aren't decided until after an election when the winner becomes an incumbent. Can you please describe the sorts of resources that are necessary to litigate these types of cases? Uh, I'll point you to our redistricting litigation last cycle in North Carolina. It was not until the 2020 election that we had constitutional elections for the state legislature and the state and, and the congressional delegation. 2012, through 2018, there was some constitutional defect in each of those elections. That affects the policies that get passed as they relate to voters of color. We see um, the legislature interfering in counties that weren't covered under Section 5. Um, so there should be more coverage, not less coverage. The legislature uh, messed around with uh, elections in Mecklenburg and Wake County and Buncombe County, those were not previously covered elections, but the legislature is the problem, the problem actor here. Um, and those many of those elections went uh, went through. We elected illegitimately elected representatives when the plans beneath were were problematic. This is why we need a new uh, new section five. Thank you. Let me go, Mr. Dead Malay. Uh, Sarah, some states, such as the state of Washington, have implemented policies that arguably expand voters' access to the ballot, while other states have not or have actively worked to restrict access. My question is, why? Why is it important for Congress to act on voting rights? How has the lack of a full Voting Rights Act weakened access to the franchise? So, um Thank you for that question. The, the history and the experience is that states do have some freedom to uh, prescribe their own voting laws, but we also have an experience of states engaging in very serious uh, discrimination against voters. There's a long history of it and it persists to the current day. 
I, I contend that it persists to enactments of, of last week that are now being challenged. So the pattern is very clear that there's a federal role. There are multiple Supreme Court precedents acknowledging the federal power to um, pass laws that regulate elections. And the Voting Rights Act is regarded as the most important enactment of Congress in the 20th century. I think Roll, Roll Call had it on that list. And so the federal role is one that is recognized in constitutional amendments. It, it, uh, con um, Congress has the power to enact, to enact legislation, to enforce those amendments, and to bring a degree of uniformity to federal elections is not something that can be left to the states. In my view, it would be an abdication of the federal responsibility to not take account of the ongoing patterns of discrimination. Thank you very much. My time has expired, but thank you uh, to the witnesses for, for your testimony uh, today. I'm going to mute for just a moment and consult with staff. End of quote. And so the point is that Chief Justice Roberts uh, decided for the court that Section 5 is a constitutional grant of power. Uh, Section 5 has not been struck down. It continues to be the law of the land. Uh, what was struck down as unconstitutional was Section 4, which is the formula that determines which states are in, which states are not in for the purposes of Section 5. And then the Chief Justice says that Congress may draft another formula. It's not an engraved invitation, uh, but it's also a very subtle message to Congress that we, we should come up with another formula. And that's what we are doing today. And we will be doing in the next uh, few weeks as we conduct these field hearings all across the country. Uh, we cannot draft a formula. Uh, we cannot draft a formula uh, without having valuable testimony from people who are knowledgeable. And so thank you to the witnesses for your testimony. It will become a part of this congressional record, uh, which may be used one day to update the formula to section four. Is there anything further from any of the committee members? All right. I'm very thankful for staff.
Uh, I want to thank the staff also for traveling from Washington, D.C. to Wilson, North Carolina this morning to participate in this hearing. I wish you could see the setup uh, that we have here in the Wilson Operations Center. Uh, it's a very elaborate setup with the camera and the laptop and a big screen monitor and staff all around. Uh, and thank all of them for, for, for all of the work that they do in support of, of our work. So thank you. Uh, the magic language is without objection. The Committee on House Administration stands adjourned. Bye.